Many thanks, uh, Cathy, for the introduction, and good evening, everyone. I see some former colleagues uh, from the department in the audience tonight, and of course, uh, many old friends and staff and students. And thank you to the Political Studies Department for asking me to give the lecture again. It may sound like ancient history to talk about Bob and Nolene Chapman and the founding of the Political Studies Department. I came along in 1968 as a first year student and the department was uh, five years old. And Bob Chapman had a major influence on me and countless other students during his long career at this university. He was an astute observer of domestic politics and of world affairs. He certainly helped me to hone my ideas and beliefs into a coherent philosophy, which I could later apply to a political career and now to my position at the UN Development Program. So I personally owe Bob Chapman a lot for his interest in my intellectual development and for instilling in me a drive for rigor and evidence-based approaches in my career, first at the university, then in parliament and in government, and now at UNDP. And I'm sure many other former students would say the same. So such a seminal figure in New Zealand's intellectual life fully merits the naming of an annual lecture series in his honour. And I certainly hope the series will continue long beyond the contributions to it of those of us who knew Bob personally and benefited from his advice. The series began before Bob and his uh, late wife, Nolene, uh, passed away. And I should also pay tribute to Nolene in this lecture because Bob and Nolene together opened their homes and their hearts to us as, as students, which was a tremendous uh, privilege to us. So they were both there when I gave the Foundation Chapman Lecture in November 2000, and I have been back and, and read it. To me, it seems like a lifetime ago. They were very different times for me, for New Zealand, and for the world. But there is a link in that lecture of November 2000 to the topic I'm addressing tonight. As in that lecture, I referred to the Millennium Summit of the United Nations, which I'd just been to as Prime Minister two months before. I do look back to 2000 and remember there was a feeling about it that it was a time of hope. That was when we got over uh, worrying about whether the Y2K bug was going to wipe out all data on every computer. Uh, but hope was the spirit of the Millennium Declaration, which was issued by uh, leaders of governments from around the world, including me at the United Nations in September 2000. And the Millennium Declaration was a clarion call for a more uh, peaceful, prosperous and just world in the 21st century than that which the 20th century had delivered. And actually, the 20th century was a shocker with its two world uh, wars, uh, many uh, colonial struggles which took a terrible toll on people. It, it wasn't uh, really a, a great century in many uh, respects. The Millennium Declaration, which we signed in New York in that September, foreshadowed the Millennium Development Goals which were later launched by Kofi Annan, Secretary General, and they specifically called for realizing a number of development targets by 2015. So in the declaration itself, which we signed, uh, it aspired to halve the proportion of the world's peoples who lived in extreme poverty, in hunger, and couldn't access safe drinking water. It called for all children to be able to complete their elementary school education, for substantial reductions in maternal and child mortality, for turning the tide on HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, encouraging the pharmaceuticals industry to make essential drugs more accessible and giving special support to HIV, AIDS orphans. It called for a significant improvement in the lives of slum dwellers, for gender equality and women's empowerment, for making the benefits of new technologies particularly in the information and communications area available to all, and developing strong partnerships with the private sector and civil society for development and poverty eradication. Now, all of those elements of the Millennium Declaration were further elaborated on in the MDGs. And I mention that because it's often fashionable in some quarters to dismiss the MDGs 
as not being the product of a broader consultative process. But the fact that the key elements of what were to become the MDGs were agreed by the leaders of the 189 delegations at the UN summit in 2000, most of them like me, heads of government or uh, heads of state, uh, certainly gave them weight. Whatever the debate about their origins, the MDGs got a lot of traction. And many developing countries over the last 13 years have put these goals and targets into their national development plans, and they've been measuring progress against them ever since. There is a vast volume of national, regional, and global reports produced on MDG progress, and we now have a particular focus on accelerating achievement of targets by the end of December 2015, which was their timeline. But as that is going on, this international debate is raging in development circles on what a global development agenda should look like beyond 2015. Should there be one at all? Not everyone thinks so. Should it apply to all countries, developed and developing? Should there be global targets? If so, what should they be? And those are some of the issues I want to cover uh, this evening. So to begin with the issue of should there be a renewed global development agenda at all, to put that in context, it begs some more fundamental questions, like what is the point of multilateralism in general and when applied to development in particular, and are there development objectives which are more likely to be achieved if there's a global focus on them than by each country acting alone? Well, the experience with the Millennium Development Goals would suggest that global priority setting backed by action actually does get results. And we can look through uh, quite a number of the MDG targets and say, yes, things probably happened which would not have happened without that focus. If you take, for example, uh, the health targets across HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, maternal mortality, under five mortality, that have declined by nearly 32% in the burden from these MDG-related disorders between 1990 and 2010 is certainly greater than the trends before the MDGs would have produced. So it would seem that the increased global attention uh, actually does work. And I think we could say the same for the drive to get uh, every child into at least a primary school, which the world is pretty close to achieving. Overall, evidence seems to suggest that when you establish norms and priorities through international agreements and agendas, you do have an impact on the attitudes of societies, the laws and policies of countries, and ultimately on the well-being of people. Robert Putnam has argued that international agreements can change minds and move the undecided, especially where political leaders and opinion formers champion them. The impact may not be immediate, but over time, UN conventions, declarations, and conference outcomes have certainly shifted domestic and global debates on quite a range of issues. Of course, the mission of the UN itself rests on a foundation of universal values, which are set out in a series of uh, landmark documents from the Charter in 1945, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, and continuing all the way through to the Millennium Declaration in 2000 and beyond. And all of these documents and agreements provide an ethical framework for the UN's work. The studies conducted by the massive UN Intellectual History Project concluded that all these agreements have inspired change in the way countries understand and approach development. And that, in turn, has helped trigger long-term and under-the-radar change in public norms and values. And the same intellectual history project rates the MDGs as among the greatest ideas and initiatives to have emerged from the UN. The UN taking up development, of course, does go back to the Charter of 1945, when the founding members, and that included Peter Fraser as a drafter at the conference in San Francisco, realised that a more peaceful world wouldn't be possible without stable societies, 
more prosperous communities, and universal respect for the human rights of all people. And ever since 1945, the UN has linked the three pillars of its mandate, peace and security, human rights and development. And that helped to broaden the focus on development. Richard Jolly, a former deputy at UNICEF and one of the lead authors in the UN Intellectual History Project, argues that the UN's many agreements and conference outcomes have shifted the common understanding of development from a narrow economic one to one which is broad, people-centred and multidisciplinary. Pioneering UN conferences and agreements, particularly in the 70s and the 90s, were successful in making human rights, conflict resolution, environmental sustainability, gender equality and peace and peace building integral to what at UNDP we consider to be sustainable human development. But Jolly notes that in the 80s, a sad decade, rising debt and recession brought the early thinking and cooperation along those lines to a halt for a time. Those were years when the international financial institutions dominated the international development debate and agenda with their focus on stabilisation and structural adjustment programs. The priority of those programs were lowering inflation and deficits and generating economic growth. The focus was not human development. And it was said that some of the architects of structural adjustment went so far as to argue that making the lives of the poor worse in the short term could be justified in the name of development. The result was what has been described as a lost decade for development, particularly for sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. But it was in those years that the UN development arm took on the role of constructive dissent from the Washington Consensus. In 1985, UNICEF began promoting the need for adjustment with a human face. And in 1990, UNDP issued its first annual human development report, which crystallised earlier thinking and offered explicitly an alternative approach to the Washington Consensus by putting people firmly at the centre of development and stopping the worship of GDP. This approach pioneered by Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, still very active today, and his late colleague Mahbub al-Haq of Pakistan, a very eminent economist, saw development as being about enlarging people's choices and capabilities. In this human development paradigm, it is the extent to which people are healthy, educated and free, which provides the yardstick for a nation's progress, which expresses, in effect, the old adage that man does not live by bread alone, and certainly not woman either. And every year when we produce the uh, UNDP uh, Human Development Report, at the back you will find the Human Development Index, which ranks countries on a weighted index on uh, health factor, education factor, and income factor. Uh, always quite heartening for New Zealand, because while we're told we slip down to the 20s or Maybe if you've taken the, the Gulf and oil-rich states lower in GDP per capita in the Human Development Index, we're coming up around third or fourth these days because we are strong on health and education, which comes back to, well, what is development? Is it just the amount of money in your pocket on average across a country, which may uh, in itself uh, hide huge inequalities, or is it about how long you can live uh, in a healthy state and how much education you have? you have. A second round of global conferences and summits in the 90s linked human development and social priorities to sustaining the environment. Of course, the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, 20 years before there'd been the Stockholm uh, Conference on Development and the Environment. Other major conferences like the Cairo one in 94 on population, on ensuring food security and promoting gender equality. So when the UN Millennium Summit and the MDGs came along, it built on all this activity that had been going on for several decades uh, in the UN around development and its human uh, focus. So uh, the assessment made for the UN Intellectual History Project is that most of the economic and social goals set 
by agreement through the UN from 1960 to 2000 have been partially or largely achieved. And that, to me, makes the case for endeavouring to get a renewed global development agenda. The drive to achieve internationally agreed goals actually does have an impact on countries. I know when we were in government how prized a high ranking in an international index was and how a lower one than one would like actually could motivate some action to do something about it. And in a similar way, the Millennium Development Goals taken to heart by developing countries have had that kind of galvanising impact as well. Of course, if you're going to have goals, you have to measure them. And so having goals has also been an incentive to collect better data so you can reliably measure. And if this new agenda, uh, post-2015, succeeds in going into areas like gender-based violence uh, and other areas which are not uh, touched in the MDGs uh, because there really have not been enough priority given to them, we might get some better data and action on those hard areas as well, and I'll come uh, back to that. International agendas and goals also have the advantage of building big coalitions for action, and we've seen that through the whole MDG uh, process. Uh, it's brought governments together, civil society action, a broad uh, coalition. And MDG 8 was about global partnerships for development and pushed a rise in official uh, development assistance. Uh, and it did steadily rise until the last couple of years. Now, as official development assistance is dropping somewhat, and uh, many countries and organisations are feeling that, perhaps a new agenda might reignite some enthusiasm for the big causes of eradicating poverty and pursuing higher uh, human and sustainable development. So, if we now look beyond 2015, what sort of issues uh, could be addressed in this new agenda? Well, the first thing is you don't need to start from scratch. Uh, there is unfinished business on the MDGs, and there's a consensus that the unfinished uh, business should be addressed and that the new agenda should also reflect uh, the emerging issues uh, since uh, 2000. And quite a lot has changed. Uh, when I went to UNDP in 2009, uh, people spoke of the multiple crises uh, the world was experiencing. And, and sadly, none of them have really gone away in the last uh, four years. Uh, but since 2000, when we had this vision of hope for the new century, we have seen rather a lot of uh, very deadly uh, natural uh, disasters. Uh, more people living in more exposed places, more vulnerable to uh, natural uh, hazards. Uh, we have climate change adding to that. We've had the global financial crisis. And we have many profound conflicts uh, going on in a range of countries, and uh, some of them with global spillover effects. If you go back to 2000, there was nothing like the awareness which exists today of how serious global warming is. Now the predictions pour out of global warming not being on track to peak at two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, but at maybe three, four, or six degrees Celsius. Now, given that two degrees was said to be the catastrophic tipping point, I hate to think what six degrees would do. But around the world, we see huge losses suffered from extreme weather events, droughts, floods, storms. We get our share of it here. The stress of unsustainable global production and consumption patterns are reflected in high rates of deforestation, water scarcity, food waste, greenhouse gases emissions, the list could go on. The current way the world has developed uh, through industrialization has brought us to the brink of planetary boundaries. So continuing business as usual risks not only irreversible damage to ecosystems like the climate system, but also stopping human development in its tracks. The poorest people on Earth bear the brunt of climate change and other forms of environmental degradation, 
it is not sensible to talk about poverty eradication and environmental sustainability as separate issues. They are very closely linked and a renewed global agenda would need to be premised on a strong vision for sustainable development. A new agenda could also make links between development and the rule of law, effective and responsive governance, and the importance of peace and citizen security, all very tough issues for member states to negotiate through. The MDGs were silent on the devastation caused by violence and conflict, and I gave a whole lecture on uh, that subject, conflict and development at Victoria uh, last week. They were silent on the importance of uh, open, accountable and effective and responsive governance for development, it does help. The need for inclusive growth and decent work and the exclusion of persons with disabilities, just as some examples. And some countries did take the initiative to fill in gaps for the MDGs as they saw it and create uh, their own. So you come to the question, should there be a universal agenda with local targets? Well, the MDGs were set as global benchmarks, a good thing for every child to complete primary school, a very good thing to radically reduce maternal and infant mortality, a very good thing to turn the tide on HIV and other specified uh, diseases. The Secretary General set up a high-level panel to look at the post-2015 development agenda. It was co-chaired by the presidents of Indonesia and Liberia and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And they suggested that all goals in the future agenda should be universal, representing the common aspirations of all countries, while almost all targets could be set at national or local levels to account for different starting points and contexts. And in the ex our experience, actually localising targets and getting buy-in at all levels of government, national and subnational, certainly helps drive uh, achievement of development goals. A universal global agenda could also help address another often cited weakness of the MDGs. That was the imbalance between having mainly performance criteria for developing countries, like are all your children in school, and what is the rate of infant mortality, etc. And on the other hand, aid-centric uh, delivery uh, criteria for donors. Did you reach 0.7, which only five, uh, five countries did? And having uh, a more balanced agenda uh, affecting both developed and developing countries will probably be important in reaching uh, consensus. But the truth is that the global sustainable development challenge actually requires action by all countries. A shift to more sustainable production and consumption patterns certainly needs concerted action from the developed world in which we live here, to cut carbon emissions, for example. That doesn't mean that others don't need to do anything. Even heroic action by advanced economies to reduce their carbon footprint is not enough to ward off catastrophic climate change common but differentiated responsibility has to be a key principle for action on climate change. Then a very important question, should the new agenda focus on tackling inequalities? It's commonplace to observe that progress on the Millennium Development Goals has been uneven across and within countries. For example, by 2010, the world is estimated to have actually met the MDG target of halving the proportion of people who live in extreme poverty. But that achievement owes a lot to just one very large country, namely China. Some countries have seen very little reduction in their extreme poverty rate. On another dimension, a country may be encouraged by reports that say it has uh, many fewer child deaths, but the poorest uh, uh, proportion of the population may have seen little change at all. Since the Millennium Declaration was signed in 2000, inequality has been on the increase in many places, even where economic growth and development have been rapid. The poorest 1.2 billion people in the world account for only 1% of the total global consumption of goods and services, 
while the richest 1 billion can soon 72%. Already poor and excluded groups often face added burdens of discrimination, whether that is due to their age, gender, gender orientation, ethnicity, indigenous status, disability, place of residence, HIV status, uh, or other factors. And they typically have the least resources and remain the furthest behind. The high-level panel report, which the Secretary-General Commission recommended as a core principle for the next development agenda, that it should aim to leave no one behind. And that could lead to formulating a global goal aimed at eradicating extreme poverty worldwide. An ambitious agenda could also seek to eradicate preventable deaths, chronic hunger and illiteracy, and should certainly target gender inequality which is widely recognised as the single largest driver of inequality in the world today. More broadly, targets and indicators focused on excluded groups could be included across the agenda. I, I mention the total eradication of extreme poverty, and extreme poverty is uh, defined as living on under $1.25 a day. And I devoted uh, quite a lot of time to talking about this at the lecture in Victoria uh, last week. Because to eradicate extreme poverty, you have to eradicate it in Somalia. You have to eradicate it in Afghanistan. You have to eradicate it in the Central African Republic. You have to eradicate it in Mali, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I could go on with a long list of countries which are mired in quite profound conflict or trying to recover from it. And that's why introducing some discussion about the importance of peace and tackling violence in, in societies and the, and the legacy of, of war and conflict is absolutely critical uh, to realising a goal like eradicating extreme poverty. Otherwise, you are whistling in the wind. You cannot make development progress in the circumstances that a number of the world's people uh, live in. Now... Getting broad participation in the development of this new agenda. As I said at the outset, the Millennium Declaration, which foreshadowed the MDGs, was agreed on by heads of government around the world. But there wasn't broad public outreach on that, as there generally isn't when the UN member states negotiate an agreement. And Kofi Annan promulgated the MDGs on the basis of that. You would not get away with that these days when there is much greater expectation that people's voices, civil society voices, will be heard when global agendas are developed. And indeed, an expert review from New York University and the UK Overseas Development Institute last year on what makes international agreements work concludes that if you can bring a wide range of actors into the process of getting the agreements, uh, then you're more likely to get some action on them and implementation. And in all truth, the MDGs were a little, uh, a little slow to get traction because they came ex cathedra and took a little while to, uh, to trickle down to get action. Once they got action, they worked, but it took time. So at the start of this debate about what next, uh, it fell to UNDP as the lead agent in agency in the UN development system, system to lead the system in launching a very large global conversation about what people would like to see. And we estimate now that rather more than a million people, one way or another, have been part of that conversation. Uh, quite a lot of people in the more than 100 national consultations where we have made an effort to, to bring in uh, the voices of the voiceless as well as... Uh, of uh, government officials and, and organisations. There's been very large uh, meetings around key themes from inequalities to health to conflict, environmental sustainability, uh, critical things to be considered in the agenda. And then huge outreach through uh, a My World website which invited people to vote on what sort of priorities they would like to see in this agenda and that got a lot of take up. So what are people saying uh, they want? Well, from the public engagement, uh, from the high-level panel, uh, from other reports uh, like the one from uh, the academic and scientific communities which Geoffrey Sachs uh, 
uh, where there appears to be a consensus emerging that people want a future agenda which tackles the unfinished business of the MDGs. They want an agenda which is centred on sustainable development with the eradication of poverty at its core. They want a universal agenda which mobilises countries from the north, developed countries and the south, and they want a limited number of goals and targets which capture the key challenges for humanity in a compelling way. The high-level panel sets out 12 areas of goals and it's hard to fault uh, any of them. But getting agreement uh, will be uh, the thing. And among the hard issues is the place of peace and good governance in the new agenda. Not specified in the MDGs because it's rather difficult to get international agreement uh, on them. But there has been a groundswell of support uh, in the public engagement that we've had among citizens for addressing uh, governance as a critical issue. Uh, the desire for honest and effective governance came out as around the third priority in the global survey uh, that was done. The high-level panel report describes personal security access to justice, freedom from discrimination and persecution, and a voice in the decisions that affect one's lives as development outcomes in their own right, and suggests that global goals with nationally adopted targets aimed at increasing public participation in political processes, guaranteeing public access to information, and reducing the number of violent deaths uh, could be uh, things to go in the new global agenda. Another bone of contention will be over what in UN jargon is referred to as the means of implementation of a global agenda. Decode, that largely means money. Developing countries will say, you know, you're challenging us to reach a goal which says primary education isn't enough, you must provide secondary education, and ongoing skills training, wonderful thing, but where is the money uh, coming from? And of course, more and better quality development assistance for poor countries would help. But so would greater policy coherence in a range of areas uh, where the way the world's organised hurts people in poor countries, whether it's trade policy, migration policy, or tax avoidance and tax havens an issue that at long last the G8 took up uh, at its conference uh, in the United Kingdom uh, this year. Uh, so MDG8 aimed to create a global partnership for development. It did have targets on trade reform, on debt relief, on access to new technologies and essential drugs. Yes, quite a lot was done on debt relief at a certain point, but progress on the other areas wasn't uh, stellar. Uh, but it will be important to tackle those policy coherence issues, as it's called, in the trade. The new global agenda, when it talks about partnerships, also needs to look at the fast-changing geopolitics and geoeconomics of our world and the widening range of development actors across the emerging economies, private sector, these huge philanthropic foundations like the, the Gates and Buffett ones, the mega NGOs, the vibrant civil society in developing countries, South-South cooperation, which is cooperation uh, between developing countries themselves, will have an important role to play, but developing countries will never see that as a substitute for uh, what developed countries should be doing with official development assistance. So, where to from here in this rather complicated debate? Well, there's still two years to run on reaching agreement. This September, the UN General Assembly will hold a special event, uh, Tuesday 25th, with uh, all heads of government and heads of state going to New York, which will look both at how to speed up progress on the goals we've got between now and 2015, but it will also focus on the roadmap for where we go from here and beyond 2016. By September next year, UN member states 
involved in the UN General Assembly's Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals will issue their recommendations. And the idea is that debate about post-2015 and sustainable development goals should come together as one track. And by September next year, or before, the member states will start negotiating about what this agenda and these goals could be. And probably uh, you would look to a summit a little like the Millennium One of 2000, uh, sometime in 2015, maybe at the General Assembly in September, to uh, formally agree on that. So some th concluding thoughts for me. Two things are important right now. One is to maintain a high level of global public interest in the outcome of all of these processes and the negotiations on post-2015 and sustainable development goals. And secondly, we do need to speed up progress on the goals we've got, as the more success you can report on the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the greater the credibility of setting some new goals and a new agenda will be. But I offer the following sobering reflection. Whether or not the MDG targets are met, around one billion people will still be living in extreme poverty at the end of 2015. Many still won't have clean drinking water or improved sanitation. Many will still be suffering from hunger, malnutrition, gender discrimination, and much more. That kind of suffering is not consistent with the vision for dignity, equity, peace, and prosperity of the Millennium Declaration of 2000. The future global development agenda could be the next stage of implementing the vision of the Millennium Declaration issued in that time of hope. To rise to that challenge, the international community needs to agree that we want a transformational global agenda. But 20 years ago, could we have imagined that one billion more people would have been lifted out of extreme poverty by now? Or that polio would be gone from all but three countries? Or that four out of five of the world's children would be vaccinated, as is the case today? The world is demonstrably healthier, uh, more educated, and actually with more GDP per capita than ever before. So in the face of today's rather daunting global challenges, and there are many of them, we can't allow ourselves to be condemned by a collective failure to imagine what a better world could look like. We could work for a world where poverty in all its dimensions is consigned to history, and where we pull back from the brink of environmental catastrophe to a new sustainable global equilibrium. And I do hope that the outcome of the post-2015 debate rises to this challenge and that New Zealand and New Zealanders will be a voice for that.